Aha, right. Hi. So yeah, my name's Craig, um, and today I'm going to talk about empathy and accessibility. Um, I work for DWP Digital up in Newcastle uh, as an interaction designer. So my job is primarily designing um, government services, mainly for like benefits and that sort of things with it being DWP. Um, I'd like to start off by saying I don't have a disability yet. Um, and the reason why I say yet yeah is that the prevalence of disability rises with age. So 6% of children um, are registered as having a disability, 16% of working age adults, uh, and 45% of adults over state pension age. So that's, you know, it's, it goes up exponentially as we get older. It's really unlikely at some point you've got a 50% chance of having some sort of impairment. Um, so people living in, with a disability um, are far more common than you might have realized. Uh, it's actually 11.9 million adults, according to um, GovUK figures. It's one in five people, or 20%. Like that, that's quite a lot. In 2017, only 22% of adults living with a disability said they'd never used the internet. So if we take that away from the first, the first figure from the second figure, that's 9.3 million people that are living with a disability and are browsing the internet. That's 9.3 million people that could be trying to use your website or buy your stuff. And when we think of a disability, we often think wheelchair, but you know, there's so many things that are less obvious and, and this can really make way ignorant. It probably doesn't help that this is the, you know, this is, if, if you look up disability logo, this is what you'll find. Um, it's about 50 years old and it's kind of doing a disservice. It's normally accompanied with things like disabled parking and the problem with this is that it automatically assumes that the person is disabled when loads of people might need to use that parking space for other reasons that might not be as obvious. There's been a, a thing recently where people have tried to redesign the logo. Um, the one on the right is a lot more empowering. It shows the person being a lot more independent than the one on the left. Um, and, you know, they're kind of in a propelling forward motion, kind of, you know, getting on with things and it, it's a lot less. Um, the one on the left, they're kind of just, you know, it's not as not so obvious. This is um, now going to be, well, they're looking at trying to like change the wording around it as well. So it's accessible parking means um, it could be used by anyone with these things. Um, and, and just suddenly like the, the message is a lot more empowering basically with this wording. Uh, there's a thing online, um, accessibleicon.org, and you can buy stickers and you can buy templates and all sorts of stuff where you can actually modify these things. Uh, I'm, I think it's worth saying that I think you meant to modify them on your own properties and your own thing. I don't think you're supposed to go out and like vandalize things. That's not what I'm trying to like get at, but you know, you can't get these things online if, if that's what you're into. Um, so yeah, that moves on to this thing, which like disabilities and impairments, like they're not the same thing. And a lot of people think that they are the same, but they're not interchangeable. An impairment is the medical condition that's, you know, somebody experiences. So, for example, you could have glaucoma and you might have low vision or blindness, like that's the impairment. It doesn't necessarily mean you're disabled. A disability is when a person finds it difficult to perform everyday tasks to a level that's considered normal for most people. So this is where your impairment is getting in the way of kind of everyday life to a point where you can no longer um, do those things. <laughs> And this is really important, like I said before, an impairment doesn't always mean a person considers themselves to be disabled. Uh, that's the main difference. So for example, um, if you're in a wheelchair and you wanted to go and get a book for the library, for example, you might have your house set up. You know, you've got low benches, you've got enough space between things to kind of move around and maneuver. Um, everything is like set up in your environment so you can kind of get around. Uh, you may have a wheelchair ramp at the door so you can come and go as you please. The crossings and stuff, the, the buttons might be lowered down, the drop curbs allow you to move around. And then all of a sudden you might get to the library and it might look like this, where you suddenly, like now you're disabled, so you've got all the way to this point and now there's no ramp, um, there's no lift, there's no way of contacting anyone to kind of get by it and, and suddenly the environment's what's actually disabled you rather than your impairment. Whereas if the library had a look at something like this, you might have been able to roll in, get your book and sort of be on your way and it would never have affected you. Um, so yeah, like people are not always disabled by their impairments. They're disabled by poorly designed environments. And 
this doesn't always have to be a physical space. Like a digital space is also an environment in which people have to operate. Um, so it's our job as designers and developers to make sure that they're able to do that. The second example is purely digital. Um, imagine you're colorblind and you want to check how well a team is playing before placing a bet. It might be sad day, you might want to put an accumulator on or something. Um, but you want to make an educated bet, uh, an educated guess, sorry. So before you go and place your bet, you might want to have a look at um, you know, how well teams are playing. So you head to a popular sports website um, and down one side you've kind of got the last five games which are marked here in little sort of, um, they've got markers, so green's a win, draw is grey and a loss is red. Uh, so yeah, Manchester City, they've won four, drawn one, that, you know, pretty, pretty easy, but the problem is is that if you're colorblind, they all kind of start to look the same. So, especially if you're red-green colorblind, like a win and a loss kind of looks the same. So your accumulator is going to be knackered because you've got no idea what it is that you're supposed to, you know, you can kind of tell a draw, but that's about it. Um, that is worth pointing out, that was the BBC Sports website. They've recently done a lot of work on it, and now they've got Ws for a win and an L for a draw. Uh, sorry, an L for a loss and a D for a draw. So um, it's important to kind of not just convey things with color. If you want to simulate um, color blindness, there's actually an app for Mac called Sim Daltonism, which you can kind of just drag a window over stuff and check your designs do still work. Um, there's also a Chrome plugin called Funkify, uh, and Photoshop also has built-in things where you can kind of preview your work in these modes, and it's certainly worth doing just in case you're trying to convey something purely in color and suddenly it doesn't make sense anymore. And when using color, contrast is really important. Um, the wrong contrast can be really intense. Um, that, that can even be black and white for some people, uh, especially like a lot of websites, even GovUK, it's black text on a white background and sometimes that, that is really intense for people. People with dyslexia often prefer um, softer contrast, so there's a, there's a designer who, she's left now, but who I used to work with and she printed everything out onto yellow paper all of the time just because it was the only way she could kind of, you know, deal with it, like she, she got the information from the yellow paper, whereas the white paper was a bit of a mess. But having low contrast, you know, can make things difficult to read for everyone, so obviously if you go too far in the opposite direction, you then are going to hit a load of problems, which is why we have, um, we've got the AA standard for contrast, which is what we go to in government, where basically you're just making sure you've got enough of a contrast, um, and it's not too intense. Uh, you can obviously use the WebAIM website to check this stuff. Uh, or there is uh, another Mac app. You can tell I work on a Mac, sorry. I've got all these sort of examples that are Mac only, but yeah. Um, there's a contrast checker which literally sits in the toolbar at the top and you can just click two colors on the screen and away you go. It's not as good as the one that's on the um, WebAIM website purely because this doesn't deal with font size. This literally just deals with color. So the WebAIM one will tell you if um, so it can meet the standard if, if the contrast is not as good but the font size is bigger, sometimes it's still valid, whereas this will just say that the, con the ratio is wrong and it'll just it'll say it's a fail when it might not necessarily be. But yeah, that brings us on to basically saying that we should design accessibility in from the start and not as an afterthought. So a lot of the time, um, people get all the way to the end of a project and they've not actually taken any of this stuff into account. And then they kind of try and shoehorn it in at the end and you end up with some really clunky solutions. You could end up with something that's not fit for purpose. Um, I have no idea how this is ever going to work, but that's the solution they've went with. You also end up with some that look, they look quite terrible. So this one might work, but you know, it's not the most elegant of solutions. Um, and that's kind of because accessibility has been an afterthought. They've not thought of it throughout the design process. Even if you are thinking about accessibility, if you implement it without talking to anyone, again, it can be disastrous. This is an example, um, this is Robson Square in Vancouver, and if you go through examples of you know, accessible design, this comes up time and time again. And the idea is that they've obviously built the ramps into the stairs and tried to make it look really aesthetic, but it's an example of doing something and not actually talking to the users that'll have to use it, because if you talk to people, or you look well, you just have to look it up online and there's loads of people saying that basically the ramp's too steep. So it's supposed to have a 
a 1 to 16 gradient, preferably a 1 to 20, which means for every meter you go up, you kind of need to go 16 along. Um, and this is only to 12, which makes the ramp really steep. And it means that if you get halfway up and you get tired, there's no grab rails. So you kind of, you know, you're going to end up coming back down at quite a speed backwards. There's also no barriers at the side, so you can't actually go down the stairs sideways if you want to lose your balance at the top. Um, and obviously, because the ramp's really steep, if you get up too much speed coming down it, you're either into a wall or you're down these steps here. So there's a lot of people that actually say, although it looks aesthetically pleasing and they've kind of thought about it, they haven't implemented it right because they've not involved the people that actually have to use it. And designers don't usually make things inaccessible on purpose. Like, you know, we don't sort of sit there and, and think, oh, well, yeah, you know, let's, let's make things really terrible for people. It's just, it's a lack of, <laughs> lack of awareness. Um, as designers, we often design for ourselves. Like, we kind of look at stuff and we think, well, you know, what would I like? How would I like to do things? And that's kind of the solution we come up with. This is an example of, um, King's Cross Station after they've done a recent refurb and there's obviously a drop in the barrier but some designers went, you know what would look really good is if we just took that black all the way along to make it symmetrical and you know, for, for my eyes that looks a lot better but they've obviously missed the point as to exactly why that was there in the first place. So yeah, sometimes we try to make things better and we actually make things worse. In government, we have set patterns for the way we do things. So one of the things is a date pattern. Like if you go to any GovUK service, this is how we ask for the date, it's in three boxes. And what happened with us was um, we took this out of research and in several sessions, there was people who were trying to do this. They were trying to put the word of the month in the second box. So they put three September 1986. They hit the button to go and they got a validation area where it was like enter a valid month and I was like yeah but I put September in that is a valid month um, and this this was a this was just a normal like um, scenario where somebody was clicking in the box with the mouse typing it and whatever they weren't using any assistive technology at this point and we were like oh well that's easy we can just deal with that on the back end so you know we can just say well if they put in September we'll turn it into a nine on the back end and then like everything will be fine and this will work and it did so, like people put September in and then it went straight through and on the next screen it was like I was a nine like job done then we tested with the dragon user um, for anyone that doesn't know what dragon is basically you can just speak commands at the screen and it'll you know you can say something like click continue and it'll look for a button to click that is called like labeled continue the problem is dragon is like smart and um, sometimes it's too smart to the point where um, if you, so if you tag your HTML up properly, Dragon can kind of decipher some stuff which you might not have, which, which we weren't really aware of at the time. Um, so for example, if you've got an input type of text and an input type of number, if it's number, Dragon only tries to put a number in the box because it's, it's all, you know, it's type number, so what's the point in putting words in? So because we changed it to text to take the month, we ended up actually breaking so we'd made it better for some people and then we ended up completely breaking it for others. So this is what actually happened. Um, this isn't the actual research footage, this is me just replicating it because of GDPR and stuff we can't hold the actual footage but I've managed to replicate it and basically this is what happened. Oh, is that not? There's no sound coming out now. Oh, there we go. Three. Press tab. Nine. Undo that. Nine. Undo that. Oh, nine. Undo that. Oh, nine. <laughs> Undo that. Zero nine. Press tab. So yeah, basically, this guy was getting really frustrated because obviously. He was even trying to spell it out, he was going O9 and it was typing O H N I N E in the box. So um, yeah, so we'd obviously tried to fix one thing and then completely broke it for somebody that needed this assistive technology. Um, which is why it's really important that you test with users that use this technology. Um, and if you change anything, you have to go back and retest it because up until this point it had been fine, then we changed one thing and completely broke it. So it is really important to make sure that you're regularly testing this stuff with people using their own technology. 
you can learn to use your device's own technology. So, for example, I always do all of my coding on a Mac, um, which has VoiceOver on it. And there's about, you can get by with about 10 commands. Um, worst case scenario, you can just get it to read the whole page out and you kind of get an idea of what's going on. But it's worth learning these 10 commands. If you're working on um, Windows, you can get the open source one, which is NVDA. Um, it's worth learning these things and just and just having a go with, you know, if you've coded something up, then just sort of have a go with these things. Because a lot of the time when I'm prototyping, this is kind of the way that I write code. Uh, and my code's often quite awful. So I literally just bash some stuff in um, and off I go. And, and it seems to, it looks fine. But when you actually test this stuff, um, I've got it terribly wrong. This is an example of um, a prototype I'd built. So I'm working on a service at the moment where you can apply for bereavement support payment. And this is a staff facing system where um, they actually um, manage the claims. And we, uh, we put some tabs into the service. And the tabs, when we actually tested them with voiceover, like you couldn't actually get to the tabs at all. Um, literally, it was just skipping from No. Find the visited link. Oh. Claim the details. So it's literally visited just jumping link. from the top. Find the claim. List two items. You are currently on the link. Click visited link. So yeah, claim the task details. to complete the claim details, it just can't, can't access at all. Um, so we've got a team in DWP, uh, the accessibility compliance team, and they've got access to a load of, yeah, Joanna sat over there actually. Um, so they've got access to a load of assistive technologies and stuff. Um, and fortunately for me, there's a, a great guy on that team called Brett who puts a lot of, uh, basically I send him my prototypes and he goes through them and actually tests to see if, there's, if these are gonna work with these assistive technologies. Um, they just kind of, he'll write me a little report and kind of say, you know, I couldn't get to the tabs and then say, oh, okay, we'll go away and look at that. And, it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't mean that your service is usable, but it, it helps you find any howlers that you might have in it. Um, there's quite a few times where I've sent these things over and there's stuff that we just, we've missed. And it means that if you'd went out to an accessibility um, research session, there's stuff in there that you would have got no value from the session because there was obvious mistakes in there that you could have found yourself before you kind of went out and tested this thing. Um, so we did some work. I got the front end dev on my team to help us with it. Um, and we kind of went through it again. And link, link, find the claim. Task to complete, selected, tab, one of two, main. You are currently on a tab, two of two. To select this option, press control, option, space. So yeah, it's a really simple difference. Um, but it means that it's actually usable for somebody now that's just using a keyboard or somebody that's using a screen reader. Um, and it means we can now actually take it out and put it in front of users and we'll actually get some benefit from that session rather than them just go, well, I can't access any of this stuff. Um, and not everyone that uses screen reader is blind, so it's important to test with a range of people. We've had um, people with dyslexia who use a screen reader and we've also had um, people who've got dyslexia who use Dragon a lot just because it makes things a lot easier than trying to read or type things out. Um, so it is important to try and test these with as many people as you can test them with that have a lot of different sort of issues. And like I was saying before, it's, it's really important to research regular with users, but make sure that they're using their own devices uh, and they're in their own environments, because a lot of the time um, these things are configured a certain way so that um, people are comfortable with them and not every configuration is the same. In fact, it's really rare that you obviously find two that are. So, there's been situations um, where you know you might set a lab session up and you've set the computer up and it's got JAWS on it and then you bring somebody in and they've got no idea how to use it because the shortcut keys or whatever that they've got on their device are completely different than the ones that come as the default. Um, so yeah, it's really important to test with users on their own devices and if you can go to them and they're in their own environment and you get a lot more from the session than you do if you bring somebody in to a, an unfamiliar environment and try and get them to use unfamiliar stuff. So getting people on board with this stuff is really hard. Um, it's, not, it's not so bad in government because we're kind of bound by law to do this stuff, but particularly in companies that have worked out before government, like there doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite for this. 
they, they kind of is appetite for it, but then when it comes down to the actual money and stuff, like private companies tend to just, you know, will we'll park it for now. Um, but what I found works really well. Um, so even though I'm in, even in government where we're kind of bound by law to do this stuff and whatnot, like getting people on board is still hard. It's, it, there's certain teams and whatnot where they maybe just don't see the value in this stuff. So we have to obviously keep pushing it. And one of the things that um, I found works quite well is just trying some empathy building exercises. Um, these aren't perfect by any means, but they do, they have worked for me. Uh, everybody's probably seen this thing by now. It's the, the Microsoft. Um, they've got a lot of stuff on sort of different types of impairments, but the fact that, you know, they might not just be a permanent one. So, you know, somebody might be blind, but they might be temporarily, um, they might have a temporary visual impairment or they could be distracted or, you know, um, even something like hearing, like if you're on a train, for example, and you can't watch a video because you don't have your headphones or whatever and you don't want to blast out the video in the quiet carriage of the coach or whatever, like even that's a sort of, it's temporarily, you can't use your, your hearing. So doing things with accessibility, like, you know, at some point you, temporarily or permanently might have one of these issues and it'll make things better for everyone. So it's good to kind of go into, to make teams aware of this sort of stuff. Um, but there's like a lot of preconceptions as well, which are quite hard to break. So like lip reading, like lip reading is hard. Like people just assume a lot of the time that if somebody's deaf, oh, well they can lip read, so they don't necessarily need an interpreter or whatever. I'd say, oh, just, just have them lip read. But um, there's some really good posters actually from Deaf Awareness where you know, I can't hear you if you cover your mouth. Like, there's loads of times sort of in meetings where I'll be sat with my hand on the desk and I'm just sort of talking behind my fist and nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. And it's just simple things like that. Um, so these posters are quite good for, for that sort of thing. Um, but there's an exercise you can do where basically you just have somebody from your team mouth a word and see how many people can get it. So this is Malcolm. He's a user researcher on Get Your State Pension in Newcastle. And he's going to mouth two words and then you have to try and decide what it is that he's sort of. So, yeah, has any, anyone got any ideas? Chair. 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 Chair and chair. So the two different words, but obviously they look quite similar. Uh, this is Becky, she is a designer, also on Get Your State Pension. She's gonna do the same thing. And this is James. So James is a developer on my team on bereavement. Uh, this one's really interesting because the beard makes it even harder. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a good exercise to do. Just to, um, just to kind of you know because people just assume lip reading is easy, and obviously you've got no context. It's just two words. But at the same time, it kind of it makes you understand how hard it is. I mean, out of all of them, I don't think we got any of them in a run where we got them all right. Um, we've also, I've also got these um, Vine simulation glasses um, where they kind of simulate visual impairments. So there's ones that'll do um, like tunnel vision, like retinite, ret uh, retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration. And the idea is you put the glasses on and then we kind of do a lot of exercises where all you've got to do is read a poem or you, know, you might have to read a poster or we might put a website up and you've got to try and go through the website. Um, and obviously, like, there's a, these are good to a point. They kind of get people to understand how difficult maybe navigating a website is when you've got tunnel vision. But again, they don't kind of, um, they don't give you the same sort of sense of vulnerability that you get with it. I mean, if you don't like it, you can just kind of take them off, which is, you know, obviously that, that's a, you don't get the same sort of feel for it. But we do a few things where you just, you, you kind of try and navigate around the space and try and read some stuff. and it does kind of get people just to kind of say, actually, this, this stuff's hard. Um, another thing is just to unplug the mouse on somebody's computer and just see if they can do a, a task. Just say, you know what, go to Google and look up the BBC's website and then go and try and find out what the weather's gonna be like in Newcastle tomorrow. And the amount of people that can't use a, a, a computer when there's no mouse, it's, it's really difficult. Um, so even something like that can kind of get people to especially if it's a website where it's not accessible at all and you know, you're trying to tab through stuff and the tab order's all over the place, it can be really frustrating for people. 
Um, playing a video with the screen turned off is another one. So if you're listening to the radio, things tend to be quite descriptive because they know you can't see anything. But with videos, a lot of the time, it's really hard to kind of grasp what's going on in the video if you don't, if you can't see it. So it could be as easy as turning the laptop screen around and just playing the video and seeing if people can get the gist of what's going on. Um, another thing is just to, to play a video with no sound or subtitles. And I mean, this is like, so you've got a news reader saying some stuff. Um, you know, she's leaning in so it looks really important. And then you know, you've got a building with some grass on the side. Uh, you know, some more grass on the side of a building. A cement truck. Some people walking through. Like, you know, they, this, does anyone have any idea what this is about? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think it's about Brexit, but yeah. But basically, just you know, by, by adding the subtitles on, uh, totally changes the experience for somebody. So, you know, they said, "Oh, there's a pollution problem in London." You know, put some greenery on the side of your buildings, and that'll maybe help absorb it. Thousands of plants on a wall in Victoria. There's that cement truck again, but no mention of it. You know, it's just it's immediately you kind of, although there's no sound, immediately it, it makes sense now. Um, and like I was saying before, like there's loads of times where I'm on a train or something and I don't want to, I can't be bothered to get my headphones out and there's a video on Twitter and if it hasn't got subtitles, you're just going to go straight past it. So it doesn't just benefit people that are deaf, it's going to benefit you know, anyone, that's, particularly if it's a marketing video or something, you want people to be watching it. Um, if you want to put your own subtitles on videos, there's quite a good um, open source thing called Iggy Sub where you can kind of just put in your captions and put what time you want them to appear on the video and you can actually export them as a uh, .srt file which you can then upload directly to YouTube and then you can actually use the closed captions on YouTube. Um, at the very least, include a transcript for the video. This is literally just typing out all of the words into a HTML page or a text document or something that somebody can actually read. It's not ideal. It's obviously substantially better if you do have subtitles but as a worst case scenario, like it's better than providing nothing. Um, I'm a big fan of posters. I don't know if it's just because I'm a designer, but we like to put posters up everywhere around our hub. Um, and these are ones that the Home Office have done. They're like a lot of do's and don'ts for different types of impairments. Um, they've been really popular. I think they've been translated into about 22 languages now. They're all on GitHub. Um, but these are really great. Just th There's some simple do's and don'ts, and just having these up and around in the design space is, is really good for us because as a designer, there's, there's, it's just good to sense check what you're doing. They do things like, um, you know, if, if you're designing for users on the autistic spectrum, do write in plain language and don't use figures of speech, such as raining cats and dogs, like Id idioms and things like that. Because this can um, add quite a lot of cognitive load, unnecessary cognitive load. Like, you know, if people have to suddenly figure out what you're on about, there, there's more task involved than just understanding what it is. And it's not just for people with autism, it's like if your first language is in English, for example, and you say rain and cats and dogs, like that might just not make sense to anyone. Um, so yeah, it's the, the do's and don'ts are quite good. Uh, that kind of brings on to this example. This was a website called um, kidly.co.uk. They sell children's gifts. And there's quite a few of my friends are at that age where they're starting to have children and whatnot. So I was looking for the, a really good gift and I went on this website. I ended up not buying them a gift because I just got too engrossed in how terrible the website was and went off and wrote a blog post about it instead. But <laughs> there's a few things wrong with this. For example, they've put the error messages under the, the field. So if you actually go to this with a screen reader, you don't know what's went wrong until you actually navigate past the field and then you have to kind of go back up to it. But that wasn't the thing that kind of bugged me the most. It was this thing. So it's saying, oops, you forgot to pop in your number. Don't be shy. And it's like, that was an error because it was, it, they'd put this thing on. It said, you, your mobile number is a necessary thing for you to buy from us. And it just kind of got me thinking, like I'd not, I hadn't put my number in because I was shy. Like they're making assumptions about my personality here. Like this, it's not Tinder. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and then it, it's just kind of, oops, you forgot to pop in your number. Like, you know, if, if, if English isn't your first language, what do they mean? Pop in a number. Like, there's it's quite a few things not right with it. Um, 
so yeah, just be really clear and concise with your content, and then that can kind of give you a lot of accessibility for free. Tell people exactly what's went wrong and make your error messages kind of where people can find them. If you've never seen Stephen Proctor talk, he's from HMRC, he's an excellent designer. If you've never seen him talk about uh, content, definitely do it. He does a lot of good stuff around error messages and things like that. He's wrote a lot of content for Good UK and stuff around error messages. But he just basically says, write everything, like, like the GDS styles say, write everything in plain English and you can't really go wrong. And if all else fails, you can kind of just run the website through something like Wave, um, where it'll flag accessibility errors for you. Um, sometimes this is a good way to kind of, if somebody's not interested in accessibility, you can run it through here and get a big list of errors and say, this is how inaccessible your website is. The problem is, is that um, this will only pick up certain things. It's not going to, it's not a substitute. None of these things are a substitute for actually testing with real people. Um, so yeah, this is kind of good for picking up obvious things, and you should probably do it just to find the obvious things, but you don't, shouldn't rely on them, because they're not enough. Um, they'll only really find obvious things, and they won't find all of them. Uh, GDS did some work where they deliberately introduced 142 known accessibility issues into a page, and then ran it through these accessibility tools. Uh, and at best, it only detected 40% of them. So relying purely on WAVE, is not, you're not even going to find half of the things wrong with it. So all of these things, the, you know, the glasses, all of these little exercises, they're good things to build empathy and to find obvious errors, but they can never replace usability testing. Um, like I was saying before, because I work in government, we're quite fortunate. So by law, all public sector websites and apps need to be accessible by 2021. So we're in the fortunate position where we kind of have to do this stuff. So whether people want to get on board or not, they have to do it. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, legal sort of stuff all over the UK saying, you know, you're breaking the law if they're not accessible. But private sector companies are not necessarily exempt. Um, when dixie is a big American firm, they've recently uh, lost in court because they were sued because their website wasn't accessible. Target is another American firm. They've recently had to settle for $6 million um, out of court because they got sued because their website wasn't accessible. In fact, there's quite a lot of American companies that are all undergoing lawsuits at the moment because their websites aren't accessible. Um, America kind of changed their accessibility laws about 10 years ago. So this stuff's starting to hit them now. Like It's been 10 years, like you've had your chance. Now you're starting to get taken to court. So this is probably likely to happen in the UK as well. So although it's only public sector websites that are going to be legal to start with. Eventually, this is going to catch up, and the same sort of thing is going to happen. So it's better to be ahead of the curve, I guess. And this is the thing that's really annoying about it, is people are spending a load of money defending themselves in court, like $6 million to settle outside of court when they could have just done the right thing and made their website accessible for a lot less money. Um, and if it is money, that kind of is what your company's into or whatever. You know, there's, like we said at the start, there's 10 million people that, it's, it's 9.3 million people roughly that are using the internet who've got a disability and it's, it's, it's people that you could sell your product to and it's people that you know, could subscribe to your things and it's just people that might buy products off you. And if you do work for other people, say you're an agent, in an agency or whatever and you, um, you know, you build websites for other people and whatnot. It could be, you know, if you say, well, we can make it accessible, that could be the difference between winning or losing a contract. And it also, like, no, no, no. Nobody's kind of doing this stuff for some reason. It seems to be like an untapped market. There's very few accessibility experts out there. And in agencies and stuff like that, I don't understand why people aren't kind of buying into this stuff more. But yeah, there's, there's a, if money's what it is, there's a lot of stuff in it for that as well. But Really, it's not about money, not for me anyway. Um, I think we should all be passionate about accessibility because it's the right thing to do. Um, and if we design things with accessibility in mind, then it does make things better for everyone. Um, and that's all from me. So we've got um, some time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions for Craig? Oh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Stuart, and I'm from the Department of Education. And um, uh, we're going for an internet refresh. And um, one of the key things that I've highlighted, uh, it's always been talked about, but there's always never been no actions about the accessibility of our internet. And um, it just opened my eyes a bit, you know, in terms of like having an. Um, uh, we've got like a, what's called a neurodivergence network, people with various disabilities, impairments, and so forth. Do you think it'd be worthwhile having them working alongside us when we do the refresh? Because we're about to start our alpha stage um, end of this month, and it's going to be an intensive eight weeks, basically rebuilding the internet. So you have maybe to have them working alongside us, saying, oh, "Does this work? Does this work?" Kind of. Yeah. Um, so. If you're going into alpha, presumably you're going through the sort of GovUK cycles. Uh, yeah, we've done the discovery, and um, but um, the accessibility side of things were picked up on, but weren't really um, investigated further. It was just it was touched upon. You know, okay, yeah. yeah, fair enough. There's only me coming to these meetings and speak to um, colleagues um, outside my work who are. Designers, the cell base, you know, you're going to have like, you know, accessibility in in, in your um, internet sites that have developed a very, very, very keen interest all of a sudden. And um, bizarrely, people like in finance and, and in um, IT are very interested in getting their message out, across, out, out there, whereas people in HR who you think be equal opportunities are very resistant, you know. Yeah. It's Especially when it comes to like documents, like Word, PowerPoint, and especially Excel. In there. So, I would say if you're doing if you're doing like alpha and beta and all that sort of thing, um, if you're following the guidance, um, you'll have to kind of do this accessibility as part of them phases anyway. Uh, you're not going to get through like an assessment if you haven't made it accessible. Um, but one of the things that we always kind of try and do is just do it as early as possible. So if you're making prototypes and whatnot start trying to you know, go through them with voiceover, get rid of any obvious things and try and get them in front of users um, as, as soon as possible. Like the, the thing I work on in uh, bereavement, all of our users are uh, civil servants. Yeah. And whilst we don't necessarily have anyone on the bereavement team that has accessibility software, there's a lot of them in the department. So we just kind of hunt out people that are prepared to set aside an hour and help go through some stuff. Um, yeah, um, what I'm trying to do is build up through like a um, word of mouth kind of thing, you know, a network of people I can just call upon to look, can you, can you look at this, what do you think of this, you know, so forth. And um, one of the issues we do have is, well, the last meeting we had here was um, it talked about Google Lighthouse. And I, and I tested our, one of our internet pages on it, and it was like 79% accessibility rate which I thought was better than I thought anyway. I thought it would be like down in the 50s. Yeah. And, um, but the thing is, that I'm not technical, so quite a lot of you here, but I just want someone to show me how to, you know, to break it down, the figures and stuff like that, you know, in terms of accessibility, what to look for and stuff like that. That's, um, that's, that's a key thing. So I really like to use the lighthouse to show you like where we're going wrong, you know, in terms of like yeah. easing the use. I guess Lighthouse is similar to like Wave and Axe and stuff, um, where they're only going to find a small number of the, so you might have lots of accessibility issues that you don't know about if obviously only you only use Lighthouse. Yeah. Um, but it's a good place to start. Um, if you can kind of iron them out in there first so that that's a clean slate, then at least, like I was saying before, once you do start doing accessibility testing, you know you've not missed anything obvious. But um, yeah, it's just try and get user researchers involved and get it in front of people. Yeah, we've got them. In, they're coming in as well, yeah. user researchers as well. So yeah, once they come in, just make a point of saying, you know, when we, whenever we test anything, we have to include people that use assistive technologies. Otherwise, you'll get right to the end and end up having to shoehorn in. You'll end up with someone of them steps where you've Brilliant. just had to shoehorn something in right at the end. Cheers for that. Thank you. Great. Any extra questions? Uh, thank you for that. Um, my name's Jasper. I'm here from Moonpig today. Um, and I was just wondering, so I'm a user experience designer. Um, and one of the things I find interesting is finding out how other designers are actually prototyping so that you can test with this. Um, so I don't code myself. I work with some other fantastic developers. But 
is that the best way to test things, is to develop it, or do you know any other methods? So I've actually got another talk about prototyping, and in that, um, so in government, the majority of us code in HTML because it's a lot easier to test something that reads a browser page if you've built a browser page, if that makes sense. So like a, a screen reader just reads the HTML, so if that's what you've written, whether it's a prototype or production or whatever, it'll just read it out. Um, so it's a lot easier for us to make sure that these things are working how they should be working because we've kind of built them in the way that they should be. So we always say that prototype should be quick and disposable. So you know, like the, the jQuery thing, we'll cobble it together. But then once we've got a rough idea, it's the right thing. You know, like we've took it through a couple of rounds of research. You know, it looks like it's the right thing. We clean it up. So um, I was a front end developer in my last job. So I'm, I'm reason like you know, I'm proficient enough with HTML and whatnot. But if there's something that's particularly tricky, I just sit and get one of the front end developers to help us. And what we do is try and get the prototype, um, not necessarily production ready, but just so that the page, the markup's right and, and, and it's kind of as close to the real thing as we can get and then you can, then you can hit it with all of these tools and it's fine. Um, I've, see, I've been in places where they use like Envision a lot for prototyping. I don't know if you've ever put Envision on a screen reader, but it's horrendous. I've got an example of it on my laptop. If you find this later, I'll show you. But yeah, it literally just reads out a number that's about 40 characters long repeatedly and you just get stuck in it and can't get out. So I think for, in terms of prototyping, um, unless you're actually building HTML prototypes, it's unlikely you're going to be able to, to test these things until you've actually built them. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm working with a charity where I'm teaching IT skills to the visually impaired uh, people. And uh, what I see is that they're vulnerable, uh, especially when, when they're uh, uh, getting access to their, their email or they're getting access to, uh, let's say, a bank, bank website. So what does the government suggest or prescribe uh, to make it more secure for them? Because I know many passwords already. Because it's helping them out, but like yeah. not not everyone would you know help them out. I should. So yeah, I think um, banks in particular is there's quite a lot of bank websites that aren't even usable at the best of times. Never mind using them, you know, with assistive technology. Um, and it can be really like you know if you haven't if you haven't laid out the site at all so that it can be understood with any of this stuff like of course it's going to be really hard to wire somebody money if you you're not entirely sure it's going to the right place um and i think a lot of this sort of stuff is just like it like in government for example we do a lot of things um we share research obviously across departments and whatnot and we tend to do everything quite like we don't tend to use a lot of javascript we don't tend to do um, a lot of stuff on a page. Uh, everything on GovUK, like we've got this whole ethos of one thing per page because it's a lot easier for anyone to deal with, never mind somebody that's trying to you know, read it with a screen reader or whatever. So I guess um, I can't really speak for the banks because obviously it's up to them to kind of fix their own stuff. But if you're doing anything, just try and make everything simple, manageable chunks so don't have things popping up all over the place and don't have like information hidden away or whatever. Just try and take everything off the page. Because I think, it's, particularly as an interaction designer, there's a lot of people trying to reduce the number of clicks somebody has to do. They're like, oh yeah, but that's, that's 10 clicks to get through the service when we could do it in three. And it's like, if, if it's 10 clicks and, and everyone understands it, that's a lot better than having it in three clicks and like 90% of people not having any idea what's going on. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's up to the banks to make things simpler for people. Yeah. Just an extension. So, is is the government thinking of any uh, any further technology or any further way of at least making it more secure for them? Um, Adapting any more technology. So, I think from a government point of view, like everything has to like it goes through so many tests and QA environments and everything before anything can get through. Like it is sometimes like OTT with security and whatnot, like you, it's got to go through all of these stages before it gets kind of signed off as like, right, that's, you know, people do penetration tests and people throw all sorts of it trying to, to break it. So it's robust enough in terms of the, the technology. I think the, 
from the design point of view, it's our job as designers and researchers and stuff to test this stuff thoroughly. So outside of the technology, we need to take our screens and prototypes or whatever and make sure that somebody can get from, um, not even just the digital thing, can, can, some, can we give somebody a letter and have them go, right, oh, I know what I need to do. I need to go to a link and then I need to go through this online service and then I need to finish at the end and have them understand it. So I think there's two things at play there. Like one is definitely the hierarchy has to be, uh, the, the tech stack has to be robust enough, which, it, you know, that's not my domain, but I can't imagine in government it wouldn't be because it gets everything thrown at it. From the design point of view, it's, it's what I keep saying, banging on about research. Make sure that you research this thing to death with everyone that's going to be using it. And if people can't get through the service, there's something wrong with it and go back and redesign it. Thank you. Cool. Big round of applause for Craig. Thank you.